Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad to have you worshiping with us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God is good. All the time. Amen. Amen. Well, what do you think about that like 30 degree drop? I was telling somebody the other day that, you know, this is the time of the year where you can go from air conditioning to furnace overnight. <laughs> but God is good, and we are so blessed to be able to gather and to worship and lift up the name of Jesus, and we're pr privileged to have you joining together today to worship the Lord with us. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, as we continue our look at the book of Mark and the series we're concurrently in, our second week, The Stories of the Savior. And today's topic is going to be the purpose of parables. It comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. The interesting thing about this is that uh, this is sandwiched right between the parable of the sower and the explanation for the parable uh, for the, uh, of the sower. And so it's, uh, we're taking a little bit out of, uh, uh, out of series uh, from last week. But today, uh, I'm sure that you'll find it to be very interesting how the Lord teaches oftentimes in parables and what the significance of that is. Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through, tw through 12. Read with me if you would. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for the treasure that it is to us. We also thank you that you have given your spirit uh, by which the word is illuminated. And so, Father, we pray today that your spirit would speak to us through the scripture and cause it to find a home in our hearts that we might live lives that would please and honor the name of Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. How many of you would agree with me, just by a quick show of hands, that we live in what is sometimes a confusing world? Yeah. Pretty unanimous there, right? A world that is confusing, a world that is confused. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to like to sing to the songs that I would hear on the radio. And uh, I remember this song, Knock Three Times on the Ceiling If You Want Me, <laughs> Twice on the Pipes If the Answer Is No. I was probably about four years old, and uh, I thought the words were, Knock Three Times on the Ceiling If You Want Me. I saw the fights, and the answer is no. <laughs> wasn't the words. Reminded me of a little uh, boy who was with his uh, mom and dad in church one Sunday as they were singing Christmas songs. And on the way home that day, the, the little boy turned to his dad and said, Dad, I don't think that it's good that we would ignore Jesus. And his dad said, well, son, I, I agree. I don't think it would, it would be good that we ignore Jesus. But can I ask you, what made you think of that, you know, ignoring Jesus? And he said, well, it's like that song we sang this morning, Oh, Come, Let Us Ignore Him. <laughs> left is Maggie Weir, one of our missionaries to Costa Rica. Stand and wave at the crowd if you would. We're so glad to have you with us in service this morning, Maggie. Bless you. Maybe next Sunday you can plan on giving us a little update from the mission field. That'd be wonderful. Okay, today we want to begin then by considering the setting of this parable. Notice that in this passage it says, When he was alone. Now, this is not to mean that Jesus had no one by him at that time, because right here in the context, we see that he was with his disciples and the others. And so there were some just outside, perhaps, of that inner circle of disciples that were also along. What Mark is telling us is that Jesus was not with the masses. He wasn't with the great multitudes and the great crowds that had just been pressing in upon him over, you know, all of the events leading up to this point. We know that Jesus' ministry was well underway at this time and that people were coming far and wide to hear his ministry. In fact, it was so busy, the Bible tells us that they didn't even have a chance to take a meal and so you recall that his family was concerned for him and came with the intention of taking him back with them to Nazareth because the press was so great. So Mark is telling us that that wasn't the case here. 
that Jesus wasn't with the great crowd or the great multitude when he did this teaching, but it was with his disciples and a few others that were along as well. You also get the sense that Mark has kind of reached over and pushed the pause button. You know, one of the key words in understanding the Gospel of Mark is immediately, immediately, immediately. It seems like every time you turn around, Mark is saying, and immediately they did this, and immediately they did that. So at this point, it's like Mark reaches up, pushes the pause button, and that is meant to alert us that the teaching that is about to take place is quite significant. It's time for us to really kind of lean forward on the edge of our seat and hear what the Spirit is telling us through the Scripture. The greater context shows that there were people that were following Jesus for a number of reasons. Some of them believed. And that belief had led them to have great hope. As I said a moment ago, Jesus' ministry by this time was well underway. He had been down to Jerusalem for Passover, had done great signs and wonders down in Jerusalem, had cleansed the temple for the first time. He had taken his ministry into the south, into Judea, had ministered there. He had come back up now uh, through Samaria and up into Galilee, the region of the Galilee, and he was ministering all over there, teaching in the synagogues regularly. He was healing the sick, delivering those that had demon spirits. He was very, very active. And because of that, great crowds were following him. And some had come to believe. These were his disciples and the others. You get the sense of, again, those that were just outside of that inner circle. This belief was expressed in hope. I think of the woman at the well Jesus stopped long enough in Samaria to minister to this woman at the well and had quite an encounter with her. And the hope that was raised in her heart, for she believed in Jesus, as she returned back to town and said, Come see a man who has told me everything about me. I think of the hope expressed when Andrew went to get Peter to follow the Lord and told him on no uncertain terms, We have found the Messiah. Or when Philip went to get Nathaniel and said, we have found the one that Moses wrote about. So you can see that some who were following Jesus believed in him, and that belief gave them hope. Many of you have hope this morning because of the name of Jesus. That you face the darkest night, but you know that you don't face it alone. You see, being a Christian doesn't mean that your troubles are going to instantly evaporate, but it means you won't have to face them alone. Hope because of the belief in Jesus. And then there were those who were following Jesus who didn't believe. In fact, they were hostile against him. Some rejected Jesus in disbelief. Those that were on the periphery, those that maybe they were showing up to see, are the rumors true? Could this be some kind of a political you know, leader that's going to help deliver us from Rome? I'm not really sure. You know, we'll just have to wait and see. Skeptical at the very least. But certainly those who completely disbelieved in him. And the sad truth is that many of them who disbelieved were religious leaders. Religious leaders and those who were following them. Some of them even responded with hostility. Remember when Jesus healed the lame man on the Sabbath? And you would think that everyone would just be bowled over and they would just be filled with excitement what God was doing. Surely this is the hand of God. But that's not the case. In fact, what happened right after that healing took place, the Bible tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees went out and began to collaborate with the Herodians, their arch enemies. Those who were, you know, faithful to Herod, faithful to the Roman Empire. But how many of you know sometimes mutual enemies will make friends of opposing forces? And so they begin to collaborate with them and begin to devise a plan for how they might destroy Jesus. Not just give him a hard time. They were following, but the reason that they were following is because they were looking for charges, capital charges that could be brought against Jesus so that he might be executed. Jesus taught a whole lot about the kingdom of God and frequently used parables to teach. 
Well, as we explore, we'll understand that the setting had a lot to do with the parabolic teaching. It was meant to reveal to some and to conceal to others because not everyone who followed Jesus believed in him. So let's look then at the significance of parables. Again, verses 11 and 12. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So that, and now he quotes from the Old Testament, they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. So the parables. Actually, teaching in parables was pretty common in that time. Uh, I, I think I've shared with you before the Greek word parabole means to lay alongside. And so the idea is metaphor. It's taking a difficult concept and then throwing alongside that difficult concept something that's easier to understand and people are more familiar with. And then by looking at the familiar, they'll say, okay, I understand a little bit better now that which was confusing to me. Well, don't we do that today? This is like that. It's one of the reasons why we run into problems with people that don't have ears to hear. They look at the paradoxes of Scripture, and rather than seeing mystery, they see contradiction. And consider the Trinity, the three in one. And mathematicians say, three, one, it doesn't make sense. And so we try to throw something alongside of it that we do understand, like an egg. It's got the shell, it's got the yolk, it's got the white. Three, yeah, one. But God's not an egg. <laughs> Or we talk about water, right? Ice cube, liquid, vapor. But again, God is not water. And so what I'm saying is that there are paradoxes of Scripture that require faith to believe. But think about this. If you could contain the full understanding of the God of the universe with your three-pound brain, how big of a God would he be? He is above and beyond. And so we seek him and we follow faithfully after him, understanding that we'll understand it better by and by. There are going to be some things that we just have to take by faith and understand that there is a tension there, but that tension can be healthy because it drives us to study to show ourselves approved, to be people of the word. Can you say amen? Sometimes the purpose of a parable was to clarify, to make clear, to make a difficult concept easy to understand. But sometimes a purpose behind a parable was to conceal the truth. So why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, there are several reasons why. The first is to reveal the truth, to reveal the truth for those ready to receive it. Because not everyone is ready to receive the word. Do you remember last week we talked about the heart conditions? And the four types of soil that represent the human heart. And out of those four types, only one of them was fit to receive the seed of God's word and to germinate and bear fruit from that seed. Not everyone is ready to receive truth. And so parables are given to reveal, to reveal the truth to believers. It's a, a type of analogy. Think of it as a, a metaphor. It gives you greater understanding. Well, the parables of Christ Jesus were a fresh revelation from God, and they expanded on Old Testament teaching. But listen, they also fulfilled prophecy. Do you realize that one of the characteristics of Messiah was that he would teach in parables? In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, again, quoting the Old Testament prophet, he said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Revealing truth. But a second reason why he taught in parables was to conceal truth. To conceal truth from the disbelieving. To reserve the truth for those with ears to hear. How many times did Jesus say it? Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
hearing spiritual truth with a heart that is ready to receive the seed of God's word. You see, knowledge of the kingdom of God is in itself a gift of God and not a matter of human achievement. Listen to that. The secret of the kingdom of God is not gained by human means, not attainable by human intellect and by human reasoning. Such knowledge comes through spiritual hearing. Truth is, in fact, reserved for those with ears to hear. Let them hear. In other words, the secret of the kingdom of God is a matter of faith. Turn and tell your neighbor, it's all about faith. It's all about faith. And listen, even the faith is a gift from God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Consider the disciples. We're talking about this setting where the disciples were with Jesus. Did you notice that they too needed to have the parable explained to them? And yet, because they had ears to hear, when the parable was explained, they got it. But I'm convinced from studying the scriptures that had Jesus just explained the parable broadly, there would still be multitudes of people that would walk away shaking their heads saying, I don't get it. Why? Because they didn't have ears to hear. No ears to hear the truth. You see, the disciples had ears to hear and by God's grace they sought to understand. They sought to pursue spiritual understanding. Their faith drove them to seek the kingdom of God. In Jeremiah 29 and 13, the prophet speaking on behalf of God, he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so Jesus is, he's saying, that's true of me. You've got to have ears to hear if you want to understand what I am teaching. He's saying if you desire spiritual life, if you desire spiritual understanding, if you want to know what the secret of the kingdom of God is, you must seek me with all your heart. And doesn't that make sense? After all, the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Parables given to reveal the truth, to conceal the truth. They were also given to focus the truth. And more specifically, focus the choice of the hearer, the one who was hearing the truth. Are you for me or are you against me? And Jesus is saying. You see, the Israelites to this point have a pretty good concept of the kingdom of God. It's clear and yet it's incomplete. They believe that Messiah will come with great, great fanfare, with, with great power, with great authority. He's going to establish his throne. He's going to overthrow the systems of this world. It's going to be amazing. And you know what? They were right. But their understanding was incomplete. They got the fact that he is coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Messiah. What they didn't understand was that according to the prophet Isaiah, he would first come as a suffering servant. As a suffering servant. The one who would give his life for us. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That it's by his wounds that we are healed. He would first come as a suffering servant. A truth that was revealed to John the Baptist when he saw Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. He would come as King of kings and Lord of lords, but first he would come as a suffering servant. They had a clear but incomplete understanding of the Messiah. And listen, they would not be shaken from this concept. They would accept the truth, even from the mouth of Jesus, but only 
if what they perceived as being the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, didn't disagree with what he said. But Jesus expanded in ways that they didn't understand. That's why when he healed on the Sabbath, they thought he was violating the Sabbath and they wanted to kill him. When in reality, he was fulfilling the spirit of the Sabbath. Rest. Bringing rest to God's people. They allowed tradition to trump the truth. That's a pretty scary thing. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I wonder, have we ever done that in our own lives? Have we ever allowed tradition to trump the truth? Have we ever allowed things that are mere methods get in the way of our Christianity because it pushes us out of our comfort zone? Listen, friends, the message is what is sacred, not the methods. Are we less spiritual of a church because we don't have a bus ministry? Well, of course not. Well, that's a method. <laughs> Pretty legitimate method. Did you realize we've got a wonderful Sunday school? And if you haven't gotten involved in that program yet, I want to really promote it. Wonderful Sunday school. But did you realize that there was a time in church history when Sunday school was a revolutionary idea? That for the first 18 centuries of the church, there was no such thing as Sunday school? And then back in the 1800s, when Sunday school started, churches split because they were like, whoa, that is of the world! Sunday school! And we laugh at that now because we think, how ridiculous. And yet at the time, it was innovation. The methods are not sacred. The message is. Elmer Towns said, methods are many, principles are few. Methods change. Principles never do. And so it's important for us to recognize that even how some who were listening to Jesus were not willing to accept truth, they allowed their tradition to trump truth that rather than cast stones at them, we need to ask ourselves, have I ever done that myself? Lord, help me to, to cause your word to have first place in my heart. We need to be willing to change without compromise. I want to say that again. We need to be willing to change without compromise. Don't compromise our message. But willing to embrace new methods. That's why we're doing two services. It's a, it's a new method. Did you know that one of the lay uh, definitions for insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? <laughs> That's insane. If you want a new result, do new things, right? Well, Pastor Greg, what if we try something and it fails? I say, well, if we try something else. I mean, what, what if Thomas Edison had given up after like the 900th light bulb that didn't work? Aren't you glad he just kept trying new ways? <laughs> The message is sacred, and we will not turn loose of it while we adopt new methodologies. Finally, we look then at the secret. The secret of the kingdom. And he said to them in verse 11, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So here Jesus introduces the, the concept of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven as it is referred to in the Gospel of Matthew, with Mark and Luke referring to it as the kingdom of God. So we see these are interchangeable phrases. Now most of the time, if you were to talk to somebody, just man on the street, and say, if I asked you what does kingdom of heaven mean, immediately they're going to say, well, it's where you go when you die. It's heaven, right? Kingdom of heaven must be where I go when I die, the follower of Christ. And certainly, heaven is a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will doubtless come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you might, might be also. So we know that, yes, heaven is a place. And we know in the, in the revelation of John that the new Jerusalem is a place. It comes down from heaven to the new earth, a place. But... When the scripture refers to the kingdom of heaven, it's really not referring to the place proper 
that we call heaven. Very, very rarely did Jesus or the New Testament writers speak of the kingdom of God in terms of the place. Rather, when you hear kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, you need to understand it as the saving reign of God. The saving reign of God. Paul speaks about this idea in Romans chapter 14. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So, how do you get joy? How do you get peace? How do you get righteousness? By living in the saving reign of God. And how do you enter into that relationship? Through Jesus Christ, the Savior. The saving reign of God comes into our lives. We are adopted into his family. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light through Jesus Christ. So you become a member of the kingdom of heaven. You become a member of the kingdom of God. The saving reign of God. C.B. Cranfield, a Bible theologian, he says, It is the secret that the kingdom of God has come in the person and words and works of Jesus. That is a secret because God has chosen to reveal himself indirectly and in a veiled way. The incarnate word is not obvious. Only faith could recognize the Son of God and the low, lowly figure of Jesus of Nazareth. The secret of the kingdom of God is the secret of the person of Jesus. That's why it's been hidden for generations and has now been revealed when Jesus came. So the kingdom of God refers to the saving reign of God rather than the universal reign of God. And we know that in one sense God does reign universally, right? He is sovereign. He is the Lord of the universe. So there is certainly a sense in which God reigns sovereignly over the universe. I guess in some respects you could say creation is God's kingdom. And yet the kingdom of God is not used in this way in Scripture. Rather, it refers to the saving reign of God. Think of it this way. Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Finish it with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the reason he teaches us to pray that way is because we are inviting the kingdom of God to have rulership in our lives. That when I become a Christian, it's not just me punching a ticket on Sunday morning, but it's literally about saying, Lord, I desire for you to not only save me, but to lead me, to guide me, to be the Lord of my life. The kingdom of God has come where his name is hallowed and his will is done. John Piper says, the kingdom of God is God's saving, redeeming reign, bringing about the hallowing of his name and the joyful doing of his will. And of course we know that there is an already not yet aspect to God's kingdom, isn't there? God is already reigning in our lives as Christians. He's already reigning in his church over which he is the head. But there is an anticipated coming of his kingdom when it breaks through in its full glory and Jesus Christ is established as King of kings and Lord of lords for all of creation to see and how creation itself groans and yearns for the revealing of the sons of God. There's an already not yet aspect to it. Colossians 1 and 13, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Notice the contrast. There are really only two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. So the question that each one of us needs to ask ourselves today is, of which kingdom am I a citizen? Am I a subject of the kingdom of God or am I a subject of the kingdom of darkness? Because those are the only two choices. Well, today we do live in a time of great confusion where many are running back and forth without a direction, no sense of meaning, no sense of purpose in their lives. Life has become a series of, of monotonous Mondays. You remember Karen Carpenter? 
Wouldn't she just love to hear her sing? I remember this one song she used to sing, Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. I told that to one of my kids the other day, and they just looked at me funny like I had a third eye. <laughs> so, Sorry, it was before your time. <laughs> The problem is, for some people, every day is a rainy Monday. Every day is a rainy Monday. No purpose, no meaning, no direction in life. So what's the, what's the answer to the confusion? What is the answer to the spiritual yearnings of the heart? The answer is to know and accept the truth of God. The truth that has a name, Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you're here today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as the truth, not a way to God, but the way to God, I want to encourage you today to open your heart to him. You know, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just in your own words, in the quietness of your heart, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. That's where it begins, acknowledging that you, like all of us, you're a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Acknowledging that and then saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I put my faith and hope in the completed work that you did on the cross, where you died for the sins of the world died for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Savior and Lord. And the Bible tells us that if we will respond to him and invite him to come and to, and to save us, that he will write our name in the Lamb's book of life where we will receive the Spirit and be signed and sealed and delivered into his kingdom for time and eternity. Not by works that we have done, but by his mercy, he has washed us and renewed us. So what are the implications for our life today then? Very simply, number one, have faith in Jesus. Say it with me. Have faith in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the wisdom of God and the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.24, Paul said, To those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and wisdom of God. So have faith in Jesus. In the midst of a culture that is running amok, have faith in Jesus. In the midst of troubled times, have faith in Jesus. When you don't know what the future holds for you, have faith in Jesus. When you're not sure what to do in a, in a big decision that you've got to make, have faith in in Jesus, he'll give you purpose and meaning. He'll give you direction. Have faith in Jesus. The second implication, spend time with Jesus. Say that one with me. Spend time with Jesus. I want you to notice something. It was when the disciples were alone with Jesus that he revealed this teaching to them. I wonder how many times do we find ourselves in a place where we need direction. And rather than just spending time with the Lord, we run over here and we run over there and we call this friend and we call that friend and we go on Facebook and we go to the Google and this and that and the other. And the Lord is just saying, I'm over here. <laughs> if you would just spend some time in the Word, spend some time in quietness, you know, God might speak to you when you're out fishing. You throw that line over the side and you're just enjoying the beauty of creation and you've taken some, ta some time to just be quiet and be calm before him and he quickens a verse to your heart and all of a sudden, I have my answer. I know what I need to do or not do. And he gives you what you need because you took time with him. The disciples were given the truth. It was revealed to them because they sought the truth. They responded to the grace of God that was poured out in their hearts and they sought Jesus. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow 
So let each day be the day that we call upon the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time that you've given us to gather and worship. We thank you for the treasure of your word, for it is the rock that tells us about Jesus and causes us to grow in our relationship with him. Today, Father, we pray that you would cause the seed of your word to land on good soil in our lives and that it will bring forth fruit for the glory of his name. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.